be in Ephesians chapter 5 if you want to turn there. Ephesians 5, and I don't have this scripture on the overhead, but if you're good at this, Madison, then it'll be Ephesians 5, 22 through 31. Um, at Sunday school, uh, one of the teachers was just teaching, you know, the kids about how God created everything, including human beings. And little Johnny, who was a kindergartner, he was just really intent on what she was saying because she was explaining to them that, that God took Adam's, one of Adam's ribs and created woman, right? And uh, so anyway, through that week, um, his mom saw that Johnny was not feeling well, like he was laying on the floor, and she was just like, Johnny, what's wrong? And he says, I don't know, but I think I'm having a wife. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I'm pretty sure Lori has more pains than I do in our relationship. Uh, maybe she thinks that she's having a man or a husband. But, uh, uh, but uh, today we're going to talk about our relationships with our spouse. Uh, we've been going through this relationship thing. We've talked about our relationship with ourselves, our relationship with God, um, you know, our relationship with the people in the world that we associate with. Uh, today we're going to talk about our relationship with our spouse as we uh, continue this connecting uh, series. Um, when, a, when a couple was asked uh, by the preacher to perform their uh, wedding ceremony, he explained to them, you know, that, hey, uh, be glad to do that, but I always have these premarital counseling sessions that I like to do uh, with couples before I marry them. And, and, the, and the gentleman says, well, that's, that, that's not necessary because we've been married many times before. <laughs> like they have it all figured out, right? Um, the reality is, is that uh, we all need help when it comes to our relationship with our spouse, all of us. I don't think anybody has it figured out, no matter if you've been married once, twice, five times, I think we all should just realize that uh, we could use help. And there's no better place to go to get help than from God's Word. He's the one who created us. He's the one that created the universe. He's the one who created this union of two people becoming one. And he has the best advice to say about this relationship than anybody else that we could hear from. And we would be wise to try to understand what he says about this relationship. You know, there's several in our congregation, I realize, you know, four of them sitting right here that uh, aren't married. Uh, and you'd be thinking, well, I'm going to go ahead and check out on this. But you'd be wise, even there are young people that aren't married, to pay attention to the sermon today. Because I, I think it can be applied to a lot of things, but it, more than anything, it's just realizing already, even at a young age, what God expects and how he wants these relationships to work. Um, many young people get nervous, you know, during wedding ceremonies. I've done several of them. Um, and sometimes they get nervous, you know, and they just kind of cry. Sometimes they sweat like crazy. You know, sometimes their fingers will swell up, and when it comes time to put the ring on, it just doesn't want to go on. I mean, there's a whole lot of different ways that we express our nervousness. Some, some even giggle. And, and Tim Coop, um, who was a preacher, he was doing a ceremony one time. And when he got to the vows, which is a very, you know, usually a uh, very somber and, and serious and sober time uh, in the ceremony, uh, he was having her repeat the vows. And when she, he got to death do us part, she just couldn't get it out. She just started laughing. The bride did. She got the giggles, you know. And, and when he first said it, you know, to repeat after me, you know, this part, you know, death to us part, and, uh, she just started laughing. And uh, there was a silence, you know. And, and she got a control of herself, or he thought, and went through this, you know. And she got out till, and then she just started giggling again. And this time, the congregation started giggling with her. Um, and so he thought he would try it a third time, and he got to that point, you know, till death was part, and she just could not hold her giggles in. And so finally, he just leaned over to her, and he says, well, if, if you don't want till death was part, how about for at least a couple years? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just thought that was funny. But regardless of Tim Cook's offer, right, God's standard has always been the same, and that is till death do us part. I mean, that's, that's the way that he designed this relationship is for us to 
have this union, this connection. And he, he constantly is saying things like, you know, the two become one. Meaning that once it's a one, it's supposed to stay as a whole. Um, Jesus says in, in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 19, 6, he says this, So they are no longer two but one. And then Jesus says, What therefore God has joined together, let man not separate. And I always make sure that any ceremony I've ever performed, that I make sure that I repeat those words that Jesus says. Just to make sure that we, you know, have this reminder and constant reminder, because we need it, right? That this is God's intent. God's intent is for marriage to take place. And God's intent is for when that union takes place, that it is lasting and, and forever. You know, one preacher was preaching on this subject And he started with this premise, and that is, the key to a lasting marriage is when a husband and a wife who are committed to each other. So the key to a lasting marriage is when a husband and wife who are committed to each other. What what do you think? Is that biblical or not? The key to a lasting marriage is when a husband and wife are committed to each other. Sounds good to me, doesn't it sound good to you? Um, What's interesting is, so that was his premise, and then he decided to get on his computer, you know, his Bible program, which I have one, and he began to type in committed because he, now he has to back up that premise, right? This isn't the way you write sermons, by the way. Uh, usually you go to the Word and then come out with the premise, uh, you know, from the Word of God instead of having your own opinion. And now let's go to the Word and support that. But anyway, uh, but I get it because, uh, you know, we've all done this for sure. But that's his premise, so he goes to his Bible program, he begins to type it in, and he can't find any supporting passages that support that premise, that a, the key to a lasting marriage is, is a husband and wife committed to each other. In fact, he can't even find the word commitment when it comes to this relationship at all uh, of, of the two being committed to each other, Right? Um, and he's looking, you know, in the King James, the NIV, the ESV, and all these different versions, and he just can't seem to find it. So he decided that he would just type in commit. Well, he found a lot of those kinds of uh, phrases. In fact, commit sin and commit adultery. And he's like, well, I'm not going to go teach them this, right? Um, so he's just, and he finally come across uh, these two verses. And one of them is in Proverbs 16, 3. It says, commit to the Lord whatever you do, and your plans will succeed. So commit to the Lord. And then he came across this other one, Psalm 37, 5 and 6. Commit your ways to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. And, and when he read these two passages, he realized that his premise was a, like a little skew, skewed. I mean, it was a little off-center. It, it's, it's not that we, the key to a, a lasting marriage is not that we are committed to each other. The key to a lasting marriage is that each of these people are committed to God, right? And he just realized that he just had it off a little bit. I kind of think that that's our biggest problem. I mean... You know, when I was set out to come up with what am I going to tell you guys about having a, a good relationship, a good connection with your spouse, uh, the first thing I was just like, I'm not, I'm not qualified to even do this, I don't think, right? Um, and, and the reality is, is that, that uh, sometimes we get a little off. We, we, if we're going to talk about good relationships with our spouse, we've got to talk about good relationships or good connection with our God. Because it is it's God who, who like holds it all together. It, it's, it, relationships are just hard. But they're almost impossible without a strong relationship with God to, to keep it all together. You know, years ago, um, a counselor, he would he'd draw this chart helping, you know, young people understand this, this relationship, you know, the, of, of husband and wife. And he was counseling with this husband and wife because they were having some issues. And, and so he drew this, this, you know, a husband and wife, and he drew this line which had arrows pointing to them and just explained to them that when we enter into this relationship with another person, 
there, what holds us together, meaning this line, what holds us together are, are, are things like our attraction to each other. You know, I mean, things that, that's like the way that the other person looks and the way that, that that makes me feel, the way that other person kisses and the way that makes me feel, you know, I mean, they're, they're, uh, you know, the way they carry themselves, uh, things like that. Also, just like common interests, you know, the interests that, that these two have. I mean, they, they're both interested in maybe music or sports or art or movies or whatever it is. But primarily, he was explaining to them that what brings these two people together and want to have a relationship with each other is how they make each other feel about themselves. Because the way that they are being treated by this other person, it just makes me feel good about me, and so therefore I'm just drawn to them even more, you see. And it's just this relationship between two people. And he just talks about this, but he says, but eventually... In the best of all marriages, if this is the only thing holding you together, you're going to have some major challenges because eventually you're not going to have those warm, fuzzy feelings for each other that brought you to each other in the first place. Eventually, there are going to be things about the other person that irritate you. Anybody ever walk through that? I mean, they irritate you and frustrate you, and, and you start feeling like this person isn't very dependable in this area, and all of a sudden, you just don't feel these warm, fuzzy feelings. They don't make me feel good about me anymore. And so what is holding this couple together? I mean, when, when that is what brought you together, and you think that's what's going to hold you together for a long time, what, what it's eventually is going to happen is all of a sudden you're going to wake up like, I don't know what's holding us together anymore. I don't even want to be in the same room with this person anymore. And at that point, no matter how good the counselor is, it's hard to have a conversation with this couple about commitment to each other because they're not feel, feeling very committed to each other at that time. So what do you talk to them about? Well, if you're a preacher, the best thing that you could possibly do it's to start talking to, instead of talking to them about each other, is start talking to them about their relationship with God. Because somehow that's the only really solution that is in that relationship, is for them to really start looking at their relationship with God. And as they grow closer to God, it's like this pyramid, right? You've seen it before. But as you start growing closer to God, this line here begins to start shortening too. And that is what brings that couple back together. This is just the way that God has created it. The Bible says some things about commitment, but it's not, just like what we were talking about, it's not our commitment to each other. It's always about our commitment, for instance, like Ephesians, which is where we are. I'm just going to read through this and then we'll talk about it. I'm going to include Ephesians 5.21, which actually should be, I know that it's above the heading, wives, and you guys all understand this, the original Greek text didn't have all these headings, didn't have these, you know, little numbers, uh, verses, numbers in it. Uh, So somebody decided where to put this stuff, but in reality, uh, 21 should be, I believe, uh, down in this next section. And so I'm going to start there. Submit to one another, talking about husbands and wives, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself a Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And 
one of the things that we find there is, is it tells us some very helpful things, right? I mean, some very practical things, and that is wives should respect and submit to their husbands as the church respects and submits itself to Christ. And it also says husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. I mean, that's intense love, right? That is sacrificial love because that's how Christ loved the church. That's why he said that as Christ gave himself up for the church, he did not live his life uh, for his own good or his own glory, but he lived his life as a sacrifice for us. And that's how husbands are to love their wives. That's what it says. So, so there is commitment talk, but that commitment talk is not based on the commitment that a husband has for the wife. The, the talk is, it's, this relationship is based on our relationship, our commitment to God himself. Just as God did this, we do this. In other words, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, that we were just looking at, it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. How come you submit them? Because you have this reverence, this respect, this, this view of Christ that you should have, and rightly so. In other words, God wants husbands and wives to submit to each other. Not because... They deserve it. Okay, I don't submit to Lori because she deserves it, and Lori doesn't submit to me because I deserve it. Not because they make you feel good. And they might make you feel good, and that's great if they make you feel good. But even if they don't make you feel good, you still do this. Why? Because of your relationship with God the Creator, your relationship with Jesus, the one who sacrificed himself for you. That is your motivation. That is your purpose and your reasoning for why you submit to this other person. So it, it, it throws the warm fuzzies out of the way. You're not staying together. You're not submitting and loving each other because you feel so much like you want to, right? And it's good if you do, but you do it anyway because of your relationship with God the creator. Ted Turner, the media uh, you know, giant, the billionaire, had this to say. He said, after having done CNN and the Superstation, after winning the America's Cup in 1997 and the World Series in 95 with the Atlanta Braves, I feel like I can do almost anything except have a successful marriage. <laughs> Uh, interestingly, you know, he was married three times. One of them was to Jane Fonda. After, I think, the Jane Fonda uh, divorce, I believe it was sometime either before that or right after. But he was being interviewed, you know, by this British guy. And I know you know him, Pierce, uh, whatever his name is. Um, but he says, you know, he had, at that point he had four girlfriends at the same time. He says, now I know that that sounds complicated, but that's a lot easier than marriage, let me tell you. <laughs> Uh, but that guy didn't know anything about relationships. You know why? He was so successful and is successful. I mean, he's still alive. And everything that he did besides marriage, because he did not go to the one who knows everything about marriage. He would not submit himself to God, and God is the only one that really, he is like the, the key ingredient to hold us together. Now, I realize that there are some people that do not have God in their lives, and they somehow stay together. Few, but somehow they do. I mean, there's sometimes you can have, some people that don't have God have terrible marriages, and some people that don't have God have bad marriages, but they're better than some of the others. But let me tell you something. Leaving God out uh, will diminish your marriage to some extent. Putting God in your marriage will always elevate it to some extent. I mean, God will always make a marriage better. It'll, he'll never make a marriage worse. Well, what fell apart is I, we both found God. I mean, it just doesn't happen. Now, sometimes one person finds God and the other person just doesn't want anything to do with that, and that creates some fix, friction, but that's different, and you understand what I'm saying. Anyway, back to the counselor guy. So he's explaining to... This couple, this, this 
relationship. And he begins to draw, just like what we were talking about, these other arrows up to God. And he's just explaining to this couple, what brought you together was attraction and, and interest and how you feel about each other. But that's not what's going to keep you together. What's going to keep you together, and he drew these lines to God, is your relationship to God. He says that's the thing about Christians. We have this edge on everybody else in the world when it comes to this marriage relationship. The closer you focus on, you know, the more you focus on God, the, the, the more you begin to focus on each other. The, the closer you get to God, the closer you become to each other. I remember when Lewis, you know, my father-in-law was performing our marriage. I, I can't remember, you know, exactly everything he said, but I do remember that he said something there about that God needs to be your number one, not each other. And he was just basically saying the same thing to his, you know, soon-to-be uh, son-in-law and, and his daughter because he knew that that was the key. And he didn't come up with that on his own. It's, just, it's somebody that has been studying the Word of God, and this is just what we know. Now, this will work if we ever have relationship problems with our spouse. Our focus should just instantly become upon God. And if your focus is on God, I guarantee things will get better, not worse. They will get better, and they could get better quicker than you realize the more intent, the more focused on God, and have this genuine connection with God. You know, we sing some songs, and one of the thing, songs that we sing is Wait Upon the Lord. And that's like probably one of the most important things in a marriage is waiting upon the Lord. Not just waiting, but waiting upon Him to intervene, to interact to to do something you know in our relationship psalm 37 which we already pointed out i'm going to read to you again but this is one of the things that says psalm 37 verse 5 it says commit your way to the lord now just think about this in terms of or in context of a marriage relationship okay commit your way to the lord trust in him and he will act and that's often when life is not going well between two spouses. That's what we want more than anything is somebody to act, you know, on our behalf for our good. And we need to commit to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. In verse 37, I mean, or verse 7, it says, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. That's what we sang about, wasn't it? To wait upon the Lord. In fact, I think there's a song, you know, that we sing often. Wait upon the Lord and he'll renew your strength. That's Isaiah 40, verse 31. And they shall mount up with wings like eagles and they will run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Do you think that that was just meant in context of everything other than marriage? No, I don't think so. I think in, in specifically, like, like that would be like on top, top of the, the uh, list of why we would wait upon the Lord so that he can renew our strength and help us, you know, to be able to run and not grow weary and to walk and not grow faint. Jude has an interesting thing to say. And I, I truly believe this could be applied for sure to marriages. But, but in Jude, of course, there's no chapter because it's such a short book, right? And it's right before Revelation, the book. So it's a little bitty. You can almost miss it. But Jude, in verse 17 and 21, in fact, over the top of that, just so you know, it, it's, it says a call to perseverance. And his, his topic is talking about false teachers that are in the world. And he's given them advice on how to persevere through that teaching. But let me tell you, what he says here not only can be applied to perseverance and false teaching, but it can be applied to perseverance in our lives in any given situation, especially in marriage. And with that in mind, let me just read this to you. He says, but you must remember, now talking to people that are having 
very difficult times with relationships, right? You must be, remember, beloved, the prediction of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. Do you think that that could be said true today? Do you, do you know any scoffers that are following their own you know, ungodly passions? It says, it is these who cause divisions. Is that true today? It is these who, these worldly people, uh, devoid of the Spirit. But listen to his advice. But you, beloved, building yourself up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus that leads us to eternal life. So what is his advice? When you have these relationship issues, you are to, to like build yourself in the most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. We should constantly be on our knees asking God for help, right? Building up our faith, keeping yourself in the love of God. Well, I thought this relationship was between me and these people or me and my spouse. No, it's, it's, it's really got more to do with you and your God and keeping your faith and praying about this relationship, praying to your God about that and just waiting for his mercy to act in that relationship. You know, a couple years ago, there was these authors, Linda Waite and Maggie uh, Gallagher, and they wrote this book, and it was, it was called The Case of Marriage, Why Married People Are Happier, Healthier, and Better Off Financially. And they revealed all kinds of statistics about this, you know, why, why uh, uh, you know, you're just better off uh, in these relationships, and also just statistics that pointed out that some practical reasons why people should not get divorced uh, as often as they do. What's intriguing about this book is, is some of the stats that they come up with. What they came up with is that the statistically, they examined, you know, r- really bad marriages, really bad relationships, and they asked this question, you know, what happens to bad marriages that don't end? Because some people just stick it out. Right? And what they found was pretty shocking. Here's what they found. Among couples who originally reported that they were in very, very unhappy marriages, and they interviewed them five years later and they stayed into that marriage, they found out this, 77% of very unhappy marriage, married couples that stayed together now call their marriage very happy or quite happy. I find that very intriguing, don't you? 77%. Of people who were, most people would have already called it quits and went their separate ways. For whatever reason, these couples did not And five years, just five years later, they are already reporting that they're either in a very happy marriage or they are in quite happy marriage. What does that tell us? And we're not talking about Christian people here. We're just talking about people. It it, it tells us that, that sticking to it often gets us the result that we are after in the first place. Sometimes we think, well, there's just nothing else we can do, you know, besides get out of this thing. I'm at my wit's end. Uh, This will never be fulfilling, never be happy. And by just doing what God has instructed us to do, till death do us part. The two became one. What God has joined together, let man not separate. For us just to wait upon God to do something even in the midst of my unhappiness or my misery or my whatever, that something good can come out of that. In other words, if I'm not a Christian, there's a good chance if I just hang in here that things will turn around. But the reality is, is the fact that we are Christians, that is always our hope. There's no reason to lose that hope in a relationship. 
that think that you can never be happy again or you're married to the wrong person. You just have to wait. You just have to understand that God has this a way of, of working in spite of bad, our bad relationships, in spite of our bad attempts at times. Here's the reality. See if you think this is true. We are all in a work of progress. Is that true? It's true for me. And, and the reality is, is all of us are not really great at relationships. I mean, we're not perfect. Some of us are better than others. I get that. But we all have our issues. And, 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 and the only way that our relationships are going to be super healthy is if we have super healthy relationships with our God. I want to take you to Ephesians chapter 2. We were in Ephesians 5, so this isn't too far of a jump. But Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. I want, to, I want to remind you of just your relationship with God here for a second. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And it is definitely that, is it not? It is only by God's grace that I am saved. It's not because, you know, God owes it to me or God just finally figured out how good of a person I am, right? It is only because of the grace of God that I have a relationship with Jesus and that he has included me into his family. That he has adopted me is what, is what Ephesians also says. And it goes on and says, And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. And you know that, Right? You can't boast. You can't go brag to your neighbors that, hey, I get to go to heaven because I'm such a good guy or a good gal. Um, you don't get to boast about your, your, your being in this salvation. You can only boast on the one who puts you in it. But this is what I want to get to. For we are his workmanship. And you understand what that means, right? We are his workmanship. I am, since Jesus came and rescued me when I was about 20 years old, I am better than I would have been if I was left on my own. I have not arrived, just like Paul talks about. I have not yet gotten there, but I am better than I was and would have been if I would not have met Jesus. I am a work in progress, but I am his workmanship. You see what that's saying? So we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, what I, here's what I want you to notice. Now, what it does not say, what it does not say to Lori anyway, is that you are Mike's workmanship. It doesn't say that to Lori. Like, like I've, man, I finally have, created this woman to be the woman I want her to be, right? Like, like it took me, you know, 28 years, but she finally has submitted enough that I have finally molded her enough that she's okay. We'll keep working at it. See, that's not what it's saying. Lori is not my workmanship. And, she, and it doesn't say, that scripture doesn't say to Mike, well, Lori is, you know, our, <laughs> I don't even know what I'm trying to say. Um, it doesn't say that, that uh, uh, you are Lori's workmanship. Like, she is molding me. We are God's workmanship is what I'm getting at, right? And here's what that means. So often in, in these relationships, we are trying to fix the other person. We are trying to change the other person. We are trying to mold the other person. And the reason that doesn't work is because that's not your job. Your job is, our job is to back off. And what is the scripture that we just read earlier? We are to pray. We are to wait. You know, we are, we are to allow the Holy Spirit to work in this person. 
We are to encourage, instead of encourage them to do what we want, we just encourage them in their relationship with God. That's the best thing that we could do. Not force God upon them, but just encourage them in their relationship with God. Because God is, God has this ability to change me. And, and the, the, sometimes when Lori and I have difficulties, if she'll just back off, God will whack me pretty hard pretty quick, a lot faster to my senses than she can, and vice versa. Because this Holy Spirit just doesn't let us treat another person like this as long as we have a relationship with him. And that's just the way that it is meant to be. Now, in our scripture that we are, our platform scripture in Ephesians chapter 5, he does give us some helpful tools in the meantime. And and that is things like, you know, wives submit to your husbands by respecting them. Husbands loving your wives as Christ loved the church, gave himself up for her. You know, in 1999, I always find it interesting when the world finally understands God's always been right, right? But the University of Syracuse in 1999, they did this big interview with a large number of married couples, and they just asked these questions. What do you want in your marriage? And so guess what the number one response was among men? Number one. It's not like the only response, but the number one response by far of men, what they want in their marriage. What do you think it is? Respect. It, what, they, what they basically said is, I just want, want her to, that she makes me feel capable. She is proud of me. She is willing to follow my lead. That's what men want. God already been telling you that for thousands of years. That's what your man wants. Interesting. Guess what the number one response of the women were? Not the only response, but the number one out of all of the responses was affection from their husbands, love. And, and, and just, just to, to know that I am your number one, that you love me intently above, at least equal to yourself and above other things. That you're going to take care of me, that you're going to provide for me, and that I'm a priority in your life. The reality is, and is that Lori is stuck with me, <laughs> and I bet there are more days than she would like that that's actually what it feels like, stuck with me, right? But the reason she is is because when we went into this relationship, we went into it with, with this things that drawed us to each other, right? But we went into it with a relationship with God. And so until death do us part was just part of it. And so therefore, when we have our issues, we get them worked out because I'm stuck with this woman and she's stuck with me. We better just go ahead and get them worked out. And I think that's one of the reasons that, that people, even in bad, un, very unhappy relationships, if they will hang in there, eventually 77%, this is even without God in their life, 77% turn it around when they have this mentality that we are stuck in this relationship. It's not going to change because then people start changing. But just think about it, the power that that has if you have that mentality and you have a relationship with God. Because when you have a relationship with God, he's just going to make you better. He's going to make you a better person. He's going, he's going to make you better you know, at, at loving another person. It just works. Best advice I can give you, hang in there. Develop your relationship with God and your relationship with your spouse will get better. And even if your relationship is good, it can even get better than good if your relationship with God gets better than good. Let me pray. Father God, we uh, thank you so much for just the reminder that we need 
of how you want us to um, view this relationship with our significant other. Father, help us to strive to just seek you, to allow you in our lives, to allow you to change our hearts. Father, we just pray for each and every relationship that is in this room, every relationship that is out there watching us online. Help us, Father, navigate this. Help us to grow closer, to grow happier in this relationship because of our relationship with you. We just pray, Father, that you would use your Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.